Good morning. morning. And let's begin class for prayer this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, for the goodness of of your government and character, and for the truth that you've revealed to us. We ask that your spirit will join us this morning, lighten our minds, transform our hearts to be like you. Pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to do lesson number eight today. Uh, Jesus showed sympathy in the quarterly of the role of the church and community, but I have an email I want to share and and something I want to just touch on from last week that I didn't quite get to. But the email came in this week and it said, we are using this book, could it be this simple, in Folsom Prison Women's Facility. We just got word that we, uh, we will be, begin in the men's facility at the end of the month and we'll need to order more then. I know you have heard this before, but this message, this book is changing lives, the lives of actual murderers. By the way, we finally got the approval to take the remedy in and it has gone like hotcakes. We need to send some testimonies in. Uh, Ch- Shadow People seems to be the one chapter that is the most eye-opening next to the first couple of chapters regarding the mind. It's amazing to have the women come in so excited after reading it. It is the highlight of our week. We participate in the most freeing work in the world. It has changed our lives too, the cycle of beneficence in action. Last week we talked about the givers and the takers, how we are changed by what we think and do. May God continue to bless you all. That's from Susan Collenberg in California. Isn't that nice? And then before we get into this week's lesson, there was a point that I really wanted to make from last week's lesson, lesson seven and Wednesdays, and it asked us to read Mark 8, 22 through 25, and I'll read it from the Good News translation first. It says, they came to Bethsaida, uh, where some uh, people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. After spitting on the man's eyes, Jesus placed his hand on him and asked him, can you see anything? The man looked up and said, yes, I can see people, but they look like trees walking about. Jesus again placed his hands on the man's eyes. This time the man looked intently, his eyes returned, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus then sent him home with the order, don't go back to the village. Now, question. First off, how would you feel if somebody spit in your eye? (laughs) Well, I I don't, at least he didn't see it coming. But, but, but the lesson, the lesson takes this story. Maybe you read the story before and had your own questions about it, but they, they, the lesson says this. What spiritual lesson can we learn from the fact that Jesus' first healing touch didn't fully heal the blind man? Now, did you notice what, what the lesson did with the text? If you read your text, if you've got yours open, does the text say that Jesus' healing touch didn't heal the blind man fully? It says he touched him twice. There's an interpretation that many people do. His touch wasn't enough. And I, this is why I want to talk about this. Well, how do we understand it? Why do you have to touch him twice? This is out of the remedy. When they came to Beth- Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged Jesus to touch him. He led the blind man by the hand outside the village. Then to avoid introducing doubt, Jesus met the man's expectations for how healing was done and put saliva on the man's eyes and then placed his hands on, on him. Then Jesus said, asked, what do you see? The man looked up and said, I see people, but it's kind of blurry. They look like trees moving about. So Jesus touched the man's eyes once more, wiping them clean. Then the man could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him home and started him to go back to the village. Have you ever actually gotten some saliva in your own eye? And until it clears, how well do you see? It's blurry, isn't it? Has anyone ever spit in your eye? I had that happen to me once, and I can tell you it's blurry for a minute. So one interpretation is that Jesus' initial touch was not sufficient to heal. The creator was, was just not quite enough, so he had to, heal, to touch twice. Another interpretation is exactly what it says, that he touched him twice because he could see, but it was all blurry, and, and I think he was just simply clean, cleaning his eyes now from the saliva, and now he could see. But that's an interpretation too. Which interpretation do you like better? Yeah. Maybe the more that um, the more you're in tune with God, the more He touches, the more you're in tune with Him, the better you see Him. Even you know what I'm saying? He touched Him once, and it was blurry, but He touched Him again, again, and it was clear. Just the more you, the more you know Him, the the clearer He is. So, so this is the question: Do we think that His healing virtue, the power uh, to fix the broken physiology, didn't happen fully on the first time? 
Yes. Yeah, that, so he didn't have enough faith, and so somehow God's ability to heal the man was, was impaired by his faith. Another interpretation would simply be that the guy's eyes were completely healed, but accommodation didn't happen, if you know what accommodation is. Yes, Wendell? You hear many people, or many stories about people who are addicted to this item or another, and they pray, and some walk away never having touched the stuff again. Others go through a process. Yes, and that's true. Both of them are divine power. We could not do it without divine power. Yep. Yeah, we're, 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 we're switching areas now we talk about addiction, though, because addiction requires a willful choice and a willful participation in a, in a behavior. Being able to see visually is simply an ability that you either possess or don't possess. But some, some who are addicted don't never even have the desire. I get that, but it's still a willful participation, and the desire is taken from them. You're right. I have I've patients like that. They prayed, and others then have a struggle in their, with their higher power, and they get the victory, and, and that happens both directions. But the, the ability to see is simply an ability. You either have the ability, you don't have the ability. One other explanation besides the saliva that, that could be physiologic is that when your eyes are widely dilated, it's often harder to focus, things are, are blurry. And here's a person who's been blind and he gets his eyes healed. That first initial looking is going, his whole neural circuitry is adjusting and accommodating to new information that it hasn't really ever processed before. And it takes a moment to adjust and accommodate. So that's just another, I, I just personally am not comfortable with the idea that Jesus, the creator, didn't have the ability to heal him the first time and had to touch him twice. That just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't compete with my brain. Lesson eight. It says, uh, Jesus showed sympathy. In Sunday's uh, first paragraph, it's in Sunday's lesson, it says, the universe can seem like a very scary place, vast, cold, and so big, we sense our own insignificance and meaninglessness amid it. This fear has become even more prevalent with the advent of modern science, whose giant telescopes have revealed a cosmos much larger and vaster than our imaginations can readily grasp. Add to that the extravagant claims of Darwinism, which in most popular versions dismiss the idea of a creator, and people can understandably struggle with a sense of hopelessness amid a vast creation that seems to care nothing about us. Is it true that viewing the future with a belief that we live only a few years on this earth, pass from existence, and there's nothing beyond other than vast emptinesses of space, that if you view the future that way, that it can contribute to a sense of meaninglessness, purposelessness, and hopelessness. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that, that observation's true. Um, but what do you think was a major contributing factor to the rise of Darwinism and a godless worldview. Inappropriate view of God. He says an inappropriate view of God. This is out of uh, Christian Education, page 73. Satan has ascribed to God all the evils to which flesh is heir. Notice what that means. It's old kind of English. How would you say that today? All the evils to which flesh is heir, you would say, he makes God out to look like sinful human beings. Okay, all the evils to which flesh is heir. He has represented him as a God who delights in the suffering of his creatures, who is revengeful and implacable. It was Satan who originated the doctrine of eternal torment as a punishment for sin, because in this way he could lead men into infidelity and rebellion, distract souls, and dethrone human reason. What has Satan done? As Wendell said, he's misrepresented God, but specifically, how has he misrepresented him? To be like sinful human beings, arbitrary, capricious, who can actually take pleasure in torturing his own creatures and then, and then torture his children in eternal torment, which dethrones human reason. How does it dethrone human reason? Because it's completely unreasonable. Even a sinful being, even a mean sinful being wouldn't torture their own family for all eternity. We wouldn't do that. But we say God does in God's love, and that's completely nonsense. It's unreasonable. And the only way to, to, to hold that view is to, well, I, I don't think about that. I take that on faith, which means I have just dethroned human reason. I've taken it out of operation. But it also leads to infidelity. What's infidelity? No longer believing. 
And so this distortion of God leads people to look for another explanation for why we're here, how things came to be, what's the origins of life. They're looking for other explanations because who could believe in an awful God like that? So here's a quote from Richard Dawkins, the famed atheist. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynist, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, malevolent bully. Do you think he overstates the, the, the case in the Old Testament? No. What, let me ask you this. We're, we're talking from the lesson, a, a worldview that causes a sense of hopelessness and purposelessness. And we've already established that if we believe it's just a cosmic emptiness, there's no future beyond the 70 or 80 or 100 years we live here, that's it and nothing more, that that leads to a sense of hopelessness and purposelessness. But which is a worse view to have? That there is no deity at all or there's a deity like Dawkins describes, which is worse? Seriously, which would be the worst universe to live in? The one like Dawkins describes. Yeah. Do you get that? Do you understand? Much of religion teaches that very thing. What do you think this is Islamic extremist God looks like? What do you think the God of the Dark Ages looks like? People will burn people at the stake and go on crusades with crosses and blamed. The KKK, what would they burn on the, on the lawn of a black person? A cross, people. Get your mind around that. I mean, it's craziness. So, when some people reject a God like Richard Dawkins has described, are they moving away from God or toward him? Toward him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're clearly moving toward him. They may not know him yet, they may not accept him yet, but having rejected that lie, at least they've removed the lie out of their head. Remember what Christ said to the Pharisees, you search the world over to find a convert, when you do, you make him twice the son of hell? See, not knowing God, being disconnected from him, we were once the son of hell. But when we learn a completely distorted view of God, now not only do we have to still come to know the true God, we have to unlearn all this false stuff. We have two hurdles to get over now. So having rejected that, they've gotten rid of a hurdle. They have another hurdle still, they don't know God, but at least they don't have this corruption. And, and I will tell you something, it's a lot easier to talk to people who believe and know God than people who are set in this other belief. It really is. The lesson asks us to read Judges, uh, three, three different texts here. First one is Judges 2, 16 through 18. And it's asking us to read these texts. I'm going to read three of them for you. And because they're citing these texts as evidences of the Old Testament revealing a God of compassion. That's what we're talking about, sympathy and compassion in this week's lesson. And they're suggesting these are texts that do that. And I am going to ask your opinion on that. So Judges 2, 16 through 18. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves with other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, he was, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under, under those who oppressed and afflicted them. That was uh, Judges 2, 16 through 18. Here's 2 Kings 13, 22 and 23. Haziel, king of Aram, oppressed Israel throughout the reign of Jehoahaz, but the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion and showed concern for them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To this day, he has been unwilling to destroy them or banish them from his presence. And then Isaiah 54, 7 through 10. For a brief moment I abandoned you, when, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with the everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. To me this is like the days of Noah, when I swore the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. 
Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And then the second paragraph states, contrary to popular notion of the God of the Old Testament as stern, mean, unforgiving, and uncompassionate, especially in contrast to Jesus and how he were, is represented in the New Testament, these texts are just a few of the many places in the Old Testament that reveal God's compassion for humanity. Now the question to the class, do you find these texts that were selected most helpful of the Old Testament to show God is compassionate to all humanity? Did you find these texts showed God compassionate to all humanity? It's pretty much focused on Israelites. If you notice, God is delivering them from their enemies. If you were one of the raiders, if you were the, the king that was attacking, would these texts help you see how compassionate God is towards you? That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Are there texts that you might have thought might work a little better to show God's compassion to the whole human race from the Old Testament? Jonah to the Ninevites. Okay, so Jonah, we talked about, was it last week, Jonah? Yes, Jonah is a great one. Here he is going to the Ninevites. God is intervening. He wants to save all the Ninevites who are not Israel. Great, great Bible uh, text to show God's compassion to all humanity. There's text in Jeremiah also. There are texts in Jeremiah. Here's one in Isaiah. Look at this one. This is Isaiah 19, 18 through 25. In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the city of destruction. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and the monument to the Lord at its borders. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians and in the, that day he will acknowledge, they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. You remember in ancient Israel, the Egyptians and the Assyrians were the worst enemies, right? But notice, there'll be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Now, isn't that a better text for showing God's compassion? I don't know. For me, it seemed like it was a more encompassing compassion. And there are others. Jonah was mentioned. Isaiah 56, my house will be called a house of prayer for all, all people, the whole world. Uh, and then we have the mixed multitude that came out at the Exodus. God is showing compassion to them. Rahab, um, the uh, Moabite, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, from Jericho. And then Ruth, the Moabitess, and Naaman, and then Nebuchadnezzar, and then the widow and her son who housed Elijah. I mean, we have all these examples where God is being compassionate to all people. So then how do we come back and understand the text that they selected where God is being compassionate to Israel in, in the position of conflict where God is actually using his power to, to put down the enemies that are trying to destroy Israel. And there's plenty of places in the Old Testament where that's happened. Is, is it not? Yes. So how do we understand that? What's the context here? It's all about the context. What is actually happening on planet Earth from the cosmic conflict, from the heavenly perspective, the angels watching, what's, what's transpiring here on earth? A battle, a battle between uh, four? For earth and for people on earth, Satan and, and God. So what is the condition of the human race after Adam's fall? What's our condition? Before Christ comes, after Adam's fall? Oh. We're terminal. Dead in trespass and sin, the scripture says. Uh, is that just the non-Israelites that have this problem? Or do the children of Abraham have the same problem? We all have the same problem. Humanity is affected with a term because all humanity will die, all, without Jesus. The entire species lost without Jesus. Everybody agree? Yeah. So God is working to save the entire human race and there are evil forces trying to oppose him to stop him from achieving the goal. That's what's being worked out in the Old Testament. And this theme, if you, I don't know if you ever step back and look at human fiction, whether it's novels, whether it's Hollywood, 
But the great works of fiction are always some aspect of the great controversy metaphor, metaphorized. It's a metaphor of the great controversy. It always is. Okay? And so with that in mind, how has Hollywood, this, this idea, can anybody see the, the, the story of the Old Testament where you have people working for good, trying to save the planet, being attacked by people who, who are sick in heart and mind that are going to destroy those good people, working to keep open an avenue for a savior that will have remedy for all humans. Any, any metaphors come to mind? The classic is, here's the classic. Zombie movies. And here's, here's, here's how the typical scenario goes. A greedy corporation develops a virulent virus that gets loose and infects humanity. It spreads across the world in a matter of weeks and the, we and the world is infected. This is a metaphor for Satan and his thought virus that infected humanity and spread to the whole population with selfishness and lies infecting our character. Those infected become, in the movie, thoughtless, mindless zombies who are vicious wild animals seeking to destroy and kill anything they can and who are contagious to those they come in contact with. Metaphor of those hardened in sin beyond healing. They can't be reached and truth has no impact on them. A remnant of humanity in the movie has yet, to, has yet to be infected and there's one child that has a natural immunity to the virus and this child is the key to saving the human race and must, uh, and, and this is a metaphor of course for the sinners who have not hardened their hearts and are still open to the working of the Holy Spirit and of course Jesus, the child who will be the remedy. The child must be taken to a secure uh, research facility with equipment to create the antidote from his blood. Uh, I, you think I'm making this? There are movies like this. Oh, yeah. Okay? Meta this is a metaphor for Jesus becoming incarnate, living a perfect sinless life in his human flesh and destroys the infection of selfishness through the shedding of his blood or a, sinless, a selfless death. A few of the uninfected humans battle the infected humans and as they struggle, uh, as they struggle to get the boy to the laboratory. This whole movie is all about the, the, the uninfected trying to get the boy to the laboratory and the... And the Zombie, crazed people trying to stop that and kill them. That's what the whole movie is. This is the Old Testament. It's a metaphor of what's happening. God is working to, to open the avenue and bring Christ to save us. Satan is using all of his agents to try to kill Israel and shut it down. Can you see the metaphor? In the movie scenario, um, do the healthy humans in the movie scenario get joy and happiness out of having to kill the infected human beings? They don't. They'd prefer not to. They're always in a situation where they're running away and trying to avoid the conflict. But they're forced and cornered to do this in order to get the remedy. And they're actually doing this to try to save. And in the movie scenario, there is always this thing that happens in every one. One of the uninfected, one of the, one of the healthy people has a friend or a loved one that gets infected, turns into a zombie and tries to kill them. Happens in every one of them. And then they have to decide. Do they let their infected friend who's now hardened against them, who's going to destroy the child, do it? Or do they shoot their friend and put them to rest? See? To keep open the avenue. This is what's happened in the Old Testament. We have to add in one other caveat. And that other caveat is in the Bible, first death is not death of sin. It's simply asleep. And everybody is raised in one of two resurrections. They all come back and live again. And so a more accurate metaphorical representation for the movie would be, rather than killing the zombies, they have freeze guns. And when they shoot them, they put them in cryogenic stores and they just freeze them until some other later date where they can be thawed out. That's more accurate to what's happening in the Old Testament. They're being, they're being taken out of time, suspended in time, if you will. And if you value scripture and Ellen White, they come up out of the grave with the same current of thoughts as they went in. They just shut down and they'll be turned back on later. That's, That's what's happening. Real life zombies. What? I think the idea of zombie may have come from that when they come up in the wicked, in the resurrection of the wicked. That's sort of the real life zombie. They're, they look like they are diseased. They're, they're dead walking people. I mean, they're, they're just showing their heart to the universe. They're not going to change their heart, but they have to show it. And in those cases, if you were to take that metaphor, I mean, they, they are put in cryogenic storage, but when they come out, they're still zombies. They they're still hardened against God, opposed to him, not open to truth, selfish. And you, and you can read some of the descriptions in books like Great Controversy and stuff about they march on the city and so forth. Um, so with this all in mind, I, do you like the metaphor? Do you see how it applies? 
No, nobody, some people are uncomfortable with the metaphor. Well, well think it through. It's a, it's a metaphor. It's not reality. The reality is, if you don't like the metaphor, just look at reality. Was, was God working with his people who would work with him to, to create an avenue for Messiah to come? Was Satan working to try and stop that from happening? Yeah, that, that's what was happening through the entire Old Testament. And that's what's going on. Yes. A hand somewhere? Yes. It's, it's evident that your imagination has a certain tint to it. And so you see a scenario and you can visualize a process through that. I think the same thing has to happen with reading the scriptures. People read the scripture with different tinted glasses. Absolutely. And see a Dawkins portrayed God. Yep. Others read those same scriptures and see a benevolent creator who is for the benefit of the world, the universe. That's right. And so what and, and so those those imagine the lenses that we look through. Right. What are those lenses? Anybody can you name what those lenses are? Imposed law. They're your assumptions, your preconceived ideas, the uh, biases that you hold, the things that you assume to be true without question. And your culture. Which are often uploaded into your sense of understanding reality before you ever decide that's the way you're going to see things. Example, there, how many in this room are native English speakers? Everybody native English speaker? Okay, think how you learn to speak English, not read and write, speak. How did you learn to speak? Yeah, what, is, is English language genetically pre-programmed into your DNA? No. It is not. If you'd have been adopted at birth to a family in Germany, you'd be speaking German today, okay? Now that English language, was it possible for you to willfully choose to learn a different language in the home in which you were raised? It wasn't possible, you couldn't have resisted it, you couldn't have stopped it. Now, when was the last time you got up in the morning and said, today, I think I'm gonna think in English. <laughs> Do you ever make that choice, unless you're bilingual, it's always on. When you look outside and see a, a, a uh, object with a trunk and limbs and leaves, you see a tree. You do not see a baum, German word for tree. <laughs> Everything gets filtered through this language, which is on, and you never choose to turn it on. It's just there. Do you think English language is the only thing that got uploaded this way? Not at all. It's not. There are huge, this is what Wendell's saying, the lenses, there are huge biases, assumptions, beliefs, attitudes that you never purposely chose to have. Any more than you chose to be an English speaker. You didn't. You didn't make that choice. It was your environment that put that in there. But as an adult, any of us are free to learn a second language, aren't we? We could do that. Yes, and then we could make the choice which language we're going to process through. Same thing with your beliefs and assumptions, and, and that's male-female beliefs, beliefs on religion, beliefs on government, beliefs on, you know, if you're raised in a socialist government, a communist government, that whole society will upload a certain view and a worldview that will be second nature to you and you'll see things with certain assumptions that we never even consider being raised in our society. These are all part of it as well. Well said. And so we have the responsibility to step back and the best we can try to learn what, what Ellen White calls the language of heaven. It's difficult to learn a, a second language. And what's the language of heaven? What's the lens we look through? The Holy Spirit. English. <laughs> King, King James English. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> but there are some who believe that the language of heaven is King James English. And, and uh, we didn't get a, a Bible in that language until 1611, but uh, that's the only, only authorized version. No. Um, the language of heaven is love and truth and liberty. <clears throat> love. If you're not looking through the lens of altruistic, other-centered love, in the setting of truth and freedom, you're not looking through the lens of heaven. And that's our challenge. We are so biased to look through the human law lens of rules coercively enforced, punishments must be meted out, or there's no justice. That's not the lens of heaven. That's our human bias. Good point, Wendell. All right, Monday's lesson. Paragraphs two through four say, the word sympathy also brings to mind related words such as empathy and pity. According to various dictionaries, compassion is pity, sympathy, empathy. Pity is sympathetic sorrow for one's suffering. Empathy is the ability to understand or share the feelings of another. 
or of others. Compassion and sympathy show that we not only understand what others are suffering, but want to help alleviate and remedy the suffering. When you hear about the sad things that have happened to people in your community, such as their house burning down or a death in the family, what is your reaction? Do you just mutter, that's so sad, and then move on, which is uh, so easy to do? Or are, you, are your sympathies aroused, moving you to, with compassion for them? True compassion will lead you toward comforting and actively helping friends as well as strangers in practical ways. Whether it is sending a sympathy card or showing even deeper sympathy by visiting and assisting with immediate needs, loving action is the clear result of true sympathy. Anyone want to comment on that? And I think most of us in this world have experienced somebody being empathic and sympathetic to us. Most of us have. Most of us have had injuries, loss, difficult times, and had a friend, a family member, somebody step close to us, hold us, hug us, comfort us, encourage us. We've all experienced it. And hopefully we've all had an opportunity to do that with someone as well, be on the encouraging, sympathetic, empathetic side. I wanted to ask, and I think we all understand the importance of this, the healing, the healing that comes in this. And if, and if it's so obvious as we discuss it, does anybody disagree that this is valuable, this is important, this is Christ-like? We all agree, don't we? Then I wanted to ask the question, if it's so obvious, it's so agreeable, there's no, there's no disagreement from, from this, this value and principle, what interferes with our ability to do it? I'm going to take the obvious one off the table, which is selfishness in the heart. Uncaring and selfish attitudes in the heart, that's the obvious one. Anybody who's uncaring and selfish and hard-hearted, then they have trouble. That's an easy one. Let's take that one off the table. That's, I mean, when I say take it off the table, we don't need to discuss it. We already accept it, admit it, that's a problem. If you've got that problem, you're not going to be very empathetic and sympathetic. But what else? Is it only lack of sympathy, lack of empathy, having a hard heart that interferes? Or could there be other things for the people who actually do have a sympathetic heart? It's overwhelming. The, the immensity of the need and the issues are, you know, I can't, especially for people who are all or none people. I want to do it all or I'm not going to do anything. And so if you see too much to do, then you just withdraw from it because you know you can't be successful against that. And does our current society contribute to that? I mean, this is to it is another thing. I mean, expose so much to it that it ceases to have as much of an impact as it used to. So what about fatigue, personal, physiologic fatigue, mental fatigue, physical fatigue? Can that interfere with your ability to be empathetic and sympathetic? Yes. Yeah. That you're just tired. You're worn out. Yeah. You're exhausted. Can that interfere? Is that, is that evil? Is that sinful? <laughs> Wendell. For those in the medical profession, I think you'd have to build a wall, an emotional wall against certain things, otherwise you would become overwhelmed. Yeah. And then that wall becomes so thick and deep that other things cannot penetrate that wall. And in fact, we were taught, were you taught to actually build a certain wall to be empathetic but not necessarily let it deeply in? Why? Because imagine if, if in the ER, uh, do you, have you ever had to uh, uh, relocate a dislocated joint? Yeah. Okay, and if you're overly empathic where you're feeling the pain with them, does it interfere your ability to do that? You, or, can't, you can't do it. No, you have to be able to say, I understand it's gonna hurt, but I'm, I'm not gonna feel that pain. And then you do it quickly and efficiently and it actually causes them less pain. But if you're so empathetic that, that you're feeling the pain with them and you're kind of going really half-heartedly and slow and, and, and it just drags the suffering out and it doesn't work well, right? So that's what you're talking about. You know. I have a little saying that I tell a lot of my pediatric patients to say, don't worry, this won't hurt me a bit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but to some degree, that's a, a wall. But I think we have that non-medical people. I mean, and we as a culture have that. So I want to unpack this a little more. So I, that's a great, that's an adaptive tool so that we can in function be sympathetic and empathetic by healing and helping the person. Even though we may emotionally wall ourselves off from feeling their pain, we're doing it for the purpose of functionally being there for them. Okay, that's an adaptive thing. But that can become pathologic. If it's taken too far, that's right. Mm -hmm. Ironically, the seminary teaches pastors the same thing. Does it? So fatigue, well, I think we can see fatigue. You have a heart, you wanna help somebody, but you're just tired, you're worn out. How about busyness? 
Can we be so busy, have so much to do, so many actual, res- we're not talking busyness with worldly things. Can a pastor get busy with church, re- real church duties and responsibilities? Can a pastor have a church that has so many people to visit in the hospital that you just physically can't get to them all? Can that happen? So can busyness be a barrier? Sure. What about ha- limited personal time or limited personal resources? You don't have the money to pay for a meal for everybody in Chattanooga who doesn't have a meal. You just don't have that money. It's not that you wouldn't want to, you just don't have it. There are limited resources. You don't have the time to cook a meal for everybody in Chattanooga who doesn't have a meal three times a day. You don't have the time. Did Jesus himself ever take time away from the people in need in order to rest, in order to spend time with his father? Did he ever do that? Was that because he lacked compassion or lacked sympathy? I'm I'm pointing this out because some people fall into that trap or are accused if you take time away that you don't have sympathy, you don't have empathy. What about, here's another potential barrier. You think somebody else is already helping. You recognize it, but somebody else is going to do it. Is that a barrier sometimes? What about presumption? In other words, you're afraid of being presumptuous. You don't want to intrude Could an empathetic and sympathetic person see a need and perceive that that person just wants some time alone? They want to have some private time. They need some time for reflection and and you don't want to intrude on their private. Could that be a barrier? Could also be legitimate. Yeah. So how do we know when to intervene and when not to? How do we know? Yeah. I just had another thought. Sometimes people don't, like, they don't want your help. They won't listen or they won't that's true too there are times people don't want help so how do we know is there can can i can i give you a cookie cutter rule here today that you can apply in all times all places all circumstances all situations that will always give you the right answer to what to do no no so what's the key yes you had a hand up um just had an observation when we lived in auburn california and made a huge homeless problem um and our church did a lot to help. I found it getting more and more difficult to automatically just do what I used to do years ago is provide a meal or whatever when it became so overwhelming and when we were obviously be taking, being taken advantage of. Um, but the answer of your question, there were times that it was very clear to me that the Holy Spirit was saying, this person needs your help. And if I acted on that, I was never sorry. So I think Listening to having a sensitive conscience, sensitive heart that is open to the movements of the spirit guidance, rather than listening, what is it that gets us in trouble when we listen to instead? <laughs> Our feelings. Pardon? The urgency. Yeah. I, I'm, I, the, urgent. the opinions of others. What will my church family think? What will my neighbor think? What will my family think? What will my, in other words, they think I should do this. I, I, I haven't been convicted that it's my duty, but, but other people think I should do it. Yes, listening to other people, it's not the same as listening to the spirit, is it? Not And do you ever, has anybody ever fallen into that trap? Yeah. The Bible calls it spiritual discernment. You know, Jesus said, that it was said of Jesus, no man had to tell him anything about himself because he knew all men. That's discernment. And I think that's a gift God wants to give us if we're open to that, is discernment about what is best for that person to fit into God's will for them. Can there be two people who have, both have genuine love, genuine compassion, genuine empathy, genuine sympathy for a situation, a person, an individual, and those two people with genuine compassion, empathy, and love take different actions? Can that happen? Or if we have genuine sympathy and action, we, we always take the same action. No. Uh, Does love and compassion and sympathy and empathy ever discipline? Does it ever say no? Does it ever refuse to relieve a burden? Does it ever do that? When Paul said that those who do not work should not eat, Thessalonians, was he being hard-hearted or was that an act of love and compassion? How, How was that an act of love and compassion? So was he saying the, the, the paralyzed man who's been paralyzed 38 years and can't move, if he doesn't work, we're not going to feed him. Is that what he was saying? No, he wasn't saying people with real disability we shouldn't help. He was saying people who have the clear ability to care for themselves but refuse to do so. 
Why? What happens to a person who is capable of fulfilling certain duties in life, whatever those duties might be, but they are negligent and refuse to fulfill their duties? What happens internal to them? Not that they're incapable by some external force, they've got two broken legs and can't go to work, but, but they're completely capable and, and they choose not to fulfill their duties. What happens to them? What happens to their character? What happens to their own self-esteem? What happens to their self-worth? What happens to, you see, it's destructive to them. Pardon? They lose all respect for themselves. That's exactly right. And so an act of love says, I love you more than just for your physiological health. I love you for your eternal health, for your soul. It makes them more selfish in a way because it's all for me. I'm here to take, I'm not here to give. And that's very difficult to overcome. And the way our system is here in the United States, it, it encourages people to get into and stay in that capacity. So do we think, do we take the mental attitude when we look at our friends in, in church, our family members, do we take that that we think the best of others who take a different action in a certain situation than we ourselves would take? Or do we think, well, they're not helping at all. They're, they're, they're not, they claim to be good, but they're not. Do we allow that that person may be doing exactly what they think is the most loving action, even though it's a different action than we would take? Or do we judge them by the way we would do it? An example would be, I had a, a relative who was an abused person and um, they wanted to leave their situation and come and live with various family, us or various other family members. And I consulted with the Samaritan Center, it was Gail at the time, and she said the better thing would be to get them into abused housing because they can get ed free education, a free place to live and stuff, and get them back on their feet. They can offer more resources than we can, right. than you can. So I was chosen <laughs> to confront this person, relative, and who I loved, and said, even though we all have room in our houses, that's not the best way to go. And so we're not offering our houses for you to stay in. We're offering this is a better path for you. Excellent. She took the better path, and it was a much better choice. Excellent. For her. Excellent example. Thank you. Do we allow the Holy Spirit to guide each person to use their abilities, talents, gifts, and resources as God directs them? Or do we presume to know how the other person should use their resources? Have you ever been pressured by someone in your own personal experience that threw this one at you? You claim to be a Christian, yet you won't. You ever heard that one? Oh, I've got that one at my office. You're a Christian psychiatrist, but you won't? Mm-hmm. How about if it's even something that, is, that Jesus endorsed? Like, you claim to be a Christian, but you won't go into prison ministries. You won't visit people in prison. Did Jesus endorse the, 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 the visiting of prisoners? He did. Yes. Yet, are all Christians, this is the point I'm trying to get, are all Christians called to visit people in prison? If 100% of Christians use their energy for prison ministries, who would preach? Who would teach? Who would write books? Who would help the sick? Who would feed the, the hungry? Who would... You know, you follow my point here. It's, it's, prison ministries, as I read earlier, wonderful ministry. But if 100% of us are doing the same ministry, think about all the neglect that happens. We can't presume to tell another person where they should be in ministry, can we? So here's an interesting quote from one of the founders of the SDA Church found in 8 Testimonies 170. Every branch of the work of God is to have recognition he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This scripture shows that there are to be different workers, different instrumentalities. Each has a different work. No one is required to lay hold of another's work and thus untrained try to do it. God has given to each according to his own ability. One man may think that his position gives him authority to dictate to other workers, but this is not so. Ignorant of their work, he would enlarge where he should retrench and retrench where he should enlarge because he can see only the part of the vineyard where he is working. Do we allow for that? I'm going to tell you one of the um, traps that I see in my office that Satan pulls empathetic and caring people into repeatedly 
is the trap of not being able to say no. Somebody calls and has a request. And it's, a, it's a, not a request for something sinful and evil. It's a request for a really righteous activity. It's a mission that's worthy of, of time and effort and resources. But you're a finite being. And you're already doing this ministry or that ministry or this calling or that calling. And, and so one way the devil gets good-hearted people out of the equation is by burning them out and exhausting them to the point that they, instead of being givers and conduits of God's grace, love, and truth, become patients and need to be cared for. And so the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot love other people well if you don't care for your own self in healthy ways. If you don't eat and exercise and get good rest and take time to meditate with Christ and, and keep your own self in a healthy physiological, spiritual, and mental state, then you become sick and need to be cared for and nursed back to health. And that's why Christ took time away from the masses because he always kept himself in a healthy position so that he could be useful in God's cause. One of the tricks of the devil is with good-hearted people to get them to neglect their own self-care. And is self-care selfishness? Is self-care selfishness, guys? There's a lot of... No, no it is not. Self-care is not selfishness. No. Yes, uh, online, somebody? I um, have several that I'm just going to kind of roll together here. Uh, first of all, Proverbs 3.27 basically says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Pause, pause, before you even go on. If you throw it out there, we gotta comment on it. <clears throat> do not withhold good. And who determines for you what good is, what is the good action for you to take? The whole point being, the good action for one person might be to give them a meal. A good action for another person might be to let them go hungry. Those who do not work shall not eat, Paul said. That to take that action for those individuals he's speaking of, that's a good thing to do for them. To give them the meal would be the bad thing. And so there's a presumption that good always has a certain action. It doesn't. Good has the eternal best interest at heart, and each one of us, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, with our own discernment, have to determine in, in every time and place what is the good action to take. All right, next, next comment. Okay. Uh Somebody commented, uh, did Jesus go and visit his beloved cousin John in, in prison? And, yeah, and he did not. Uh, uh, yes. No to that. And then the last one is that uh, are we judging when, uh, uh, when we're making decisions like this? Or is it uh, level five and up thinking? Or are we over judging? When we make what kind of decisions? Um, Okay, I, I think I understand. I think I understand. Notice, um, and thanks for that question. It's a clarifying question because I, I don't think I made it particularly clear. What I've been saying in here, whether you registered it or not, was that you have the responsibility to make a judgment in how you will exercise authority over yourself. Whether you will spend your time and energy here, whether you will spend your time and energy there, whether you will pay for this, whether you will not pay for that. In other words, when you see a need in another person, then you are making a judgment of whether that is an action for you to take in governance of you. You're not deciding what they need to do. You're deciding what you need to do in relation to them. That is your, your call to make. Yes. One principle that has guided me that I learned from the spirit of prophecy some years back is that you can't help all the poor, but you can help one. And that's a perfect segue into where we're going right now. So at the bottom of uh, uh, Monday's lesson, it says, while eating breakfast, a man was listening to his wife read from the news about a tragedy in another country that had left thousands dead. And after talking for a few moments how, uh, about how terrible it was, he then changed the subject and asked whether the local soccer team had won the match the night before. In what, way, in what ways are we all sometimes somewhat guilty of the same thing, and what, if anything, can we do about it? Did you notice they used the word guilty? It didn't say in what ways do we all do the same thing. And are we guilty? What does the word guilty imply? Done wrong. That's what it implies. So the question for you, as you read the scenario, was there a wrong done by this man? Did he do something wrong? Wendell? If you can't change the outcome of something, 
then you're not related to that story. So did if, if, if he could not change the outcome in that tragedy, then there's nothing for them him to do. I'm with you. And in fact, dwelling on the negativity of that story may be actually doing him harm. So you, so I, I love. So we have Wendell articulating that it was not a wrong in what he did. No. Any uh, yes. Um, I would agree with Wendell from, from a physical point of view, but you yourself mentioned here maybe a month ago about prayer and string theory. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we can always do is lift up that situation to God. Okay. And now physically I may not be able to help the people that lost their lives here, but I can pray on their behalf for God's intervention in that situation. And okay, I've not done anything physically, but I, I, I believe I have enabled goodness to enter into that, that scenario. Okay, alrighty. Lifting up in prayer. Other thoughts? Um, there's very, I've met very few really well-bound Christians because they're not really that connected to God. And so they, don't, they overdo. And when they overdo, Satan, lay, Satan lays a guilt trip on them to overdo. So it's a big mess. Yeah, you're, yeah, that's, that, that's true. So my, I, the point here is, do you agree that, that, that he was guilty? He did a wrong here? No. Uh, or do you see a wrong done? Now, the, the next lesson, in Tuesday's lesson, um, they talk about the story of the, uh, I think it's Tuesday's, yeah, the story of the, of the Good Samaritan. And they talk about how the Good Samaritan took pity on the guy, helped the guy, uh, paid for all, you know, the whole story. What is the substantive difference between the Good Samaritan situation and the man we just read about at the end of Monday's lesson who changed the subject? Proximity. Seriously. The good, it's exactly right. The Good Samaritan is in physical proximity to a person in need. He actually has place, opportunity, resources, energy. He can actually make a real difference. He can intervene. The man at home, and this is the function, I think, of our modern telecommunication system. In Christ's day, did they get a report from an earthquake in Japan? A tsunami that hits, you know, some island in the Pacific. Did they, did they get those reports coming in? They didn't get those reports coming in. They basically heard about the things within their local geographic area, a few hundred miles usually. And if they heard of some tragedy uh, that was farther distance away, that, that, that report came months and months later after all the cleanup and everything is, is done, done by the local community. So it's more of a historic accounting. Like we read about the earthquake in Lisbon in 17 whatever, 98 or whenever it was. Um, that's how it was for them. Today though, we turn on the news and it's tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And so Wendell says, okay, it's out of your proximity. There's no action you can take. If you continue to dwell on it, then, then maybe you're injuring yourself. You're becoming burdened. You become hopeless. You are becoming discouraged. Is the, do we actually get empathy and sympathy burnout mm. from watching the news? Oh, yeah. That we become so conditioned and deconditioned, if you will, that we don't even, we don't even react anymore. And you've heard the stories in New York City. It's a story, high-rise apartment, and a person's being raped, mugged, and murdered right below them, and there's 100 people watching, and no one calls 911. They just sit and watch. They just watch. Why? Because we're so mentally numb to the bombardment that we don't seem to be sens sensitive anymore. Is that, a, is that a problem with our society today? I like this statement that says, the enemy of the best is the good. So you can fill your life with good and miss out on the best. What you can do, you get so burnt out about what you can't do that you don't even do what you could do anymore. Yeah, and so, that, so there, this is the line I'm, I'm challenging. What happens is, and I see this in workplace settings, I have patients come to see me and they work, say, in, a, in an answering phone center where they have telephone calls coming in for some major corporation and their job is to do the customer service telephone call. Now, if it's a major corporation, how many calls do you think are coming in every day? Like, they, like say they work for Visa card or something like this, okay? So, they, so they're on a switchboard, and as soon as they answer a call, how many is lined up behind them? Or they have, their job is, I have some people work for a company, their job is to answer emails that come in, emails that come in. How, what do you think your inbox looks like? 
okay? And so the patients come to see me because they're overwhelmed. They are suffocating under the, the load in the inbox, 10,000 emails in the inbox, okay? And, and, their, and their boss is coming to them and saying, look, we're getting complaints. They sent these emails and you're not getting back to them. Blah, 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 blah. And, they feel, and they feel stressed and they're burning. And what's the problem? What is the problem here? Anybody, can anybody name it? It's where they're looking. This is where they're looking. This is the same thing when we look at all the need in the world, as I said earlier, all the need in the world. What we're supposed to look is at the outbox. Not how big the inbox is, how much work there is still to do, but how productive are we being with the abilities and resources we have? Are we doing our due diligence? Are we being faithful? Are we being honest? Are we being productive? Are we, with our limited, finite human abilities, doing a godly output? That's where we focus our attention. I think we attempt, attempt to ignore most of it, hoping that someone else will take care of it. Right, because it's so overwhelming, we get paralyzed by looking at the size of the work, rather than, as what was said over here, helping one. Look at, okay, I can't do all that, but I can help one. One I can do. And so I give the metaphor of, you've got a pallet of bricks. You know what a pallet of bricks is, everybody, right? And, you have to, and, and you've got this idea in your head that you have to personally go over there and physically lift this entire pallet and carry it to your backyard. <laughs> you would be overwhelmed with that. Even if you tried, you wouldn't get anywhere. You'd be stuck. You'd give up. You'd get hope. But how about if you just took one brick at a time? I, I'm not going to try to move the whole pallet. I'll just move one brick. <laughs> can you move one brick? And then if, every day, you just move one brick every day. What happens over time? That whole pallet is moved. And that's the kind of focus that we have to reorient ourselves, not on the need and how big the need is, but what is legitimate for me to be able to do with my energy, my strength, my resources, my abilities, and am I committing myself and fulfilling God's purpose in my life? Looking at the outbox. And it's a mental discipline, believe it or not. One of the devil's traps, overwhelming you and exhausting you, you get to do too much. Another is to let you just look at the inbox and be paralyzed so you don't do anything. I can tell you I feel that sometimes, sometimes in this ministry. So if you're online, I get emails from all over the world all the time. I don't answer them all. I have to draw a line. I still run a full-time practice. I'm president of a couple of organizations. I do lectures. I write books. I don't have time to answer them all. I can't do it. I have to take some mental rest and decompress. And so I don't answer them. I read them all. I don't answer them all. That, if you're the person who didn't get your email answered, don't feel that I don't care. Don't feel that I'm being neglectful. Don't feel that you're not important. It's about I'm a finite being. I have limits on how much I can do. Wednesday's lesson, it's about the, the funeral of Lazarus. And I'm going to touch on this in closing in that Jesus wept. And the lesson po uh, takes the position that uh, what, does it, what does this verse tell us, not just about the humanity of Jesus, but how that humanity, in that humanity, he related to the suffering of others. They're taking the position this was Jesus being empathetic and sympathetic to those in grief. I would just ask you to consider this scenario. You are actually going to the funeral of, of a close friend who have lost a loved one, a sibling, just like this scenario. But you are going with 100% certainty that when you arrive, you're gonna raise them to life. There's no doubt. You, you know what's gonna happen when you get there. You're gonna raise them back to life. Are you gonna sit down and begin crying in grief and despair? Are you really? Even if they are, aren't, you're not gonna be saddened over the loss of the love because you know you're about to give them back. You're gonna be kind of a little bit anticipated. Wouldn't you be, have a little party? I'm kind of excited uh, about what's gonna happen here. Wouldn't you be? Yes. This idea, I think, misses it over and over and over again. Jesus was not crying because of grief and sadness. Why was he crying then? Because he knew the response of these people. The, the Pharisees were to kill him and Lazarus again. You know, imagine if you uh, walked up on somebody with a broken leg and they were suffering in terrible pain and you had 100% certainty and ability to miraculously and instantly heal their leg. Would you sit down and cry with them for 20 or 30 minutes and let them suffer longer? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what they're saying he did. Let's just let them suffer longer. No, I, I think he was shedding tears, not, not of the empathy of the grief, but he was crying because of the body of people there had no 
perspective. They had no faith in him. They had no confidence. Their failure to understand reality. Uh, he stood amongst them as they're here, and they, and they were rejecting him, that they were actually cutting themselves off from eternal life. And, and, and even though he's about to do this, he knew that when he did this, that they were going to turn against him for it. And he was crying for their eternal loss, not the loss of Lazarus. This is my thought. And if you read in the lesson, third paragraph. Humanity, future hum humanity too. Yes. And if you read in the lesson, uh, the third paragraph, it says, the weight of the grief of ages was upon him. He saw the terrible effects of the transgression of God's law. He saw that in the history of the world, beginning with the death of Abel, the conflict between good and evil had been unceasing. Looking down the years to come, he saw the suffering and sorrow, tears and death that were to be the lot of men. His heart was pierced with the pain of the human family of all ages and all lands. The woes of the sinful race were heavy upon his soul and the a fountain of his tears was broken up as he longed to relieve their distress. This is much bigger than just empathizing with a family that he was about to relieve and they were going to be rejoicing and partying in a few minutes with happiness. I think this happens a lot when people read scripture. They read into it something that really isn't there and it takes time to actually unpack and ask, and ask the questions. Really? Does that actually make sense to you? If you were at a funeral and you were about to raise somebody, I mean, just ask those questions when you're reading it and, and, and some ideas will pop into your mind. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you did send Jesus, that through the, the entire history of the human race, you've been fighting for us, Lord, fighting against evil, fighting against the devil, fighting against lies and distortion, fighting against selfishness, working with all of your resources and agencies to pour love and truth into our hearts and minds and ultimately bringing Jesus to be our remedy, to be our savior, to restore us back into unity and oneness with you. We ask that your spirit now will take all that Christ has achieved, reproduce it in us, enlighten our minds, help, help disabuse us of our biases and assumptions and preconceived ideas that keep us from knowing you and bring us back into unity with you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen.